Very good. Um, so thanks, Sarah, for your introduction. Um, uh, and so welcome, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to talk today. I'm going to be talking today about a few case studies in electrolyte disorders with a renal spin. Um, this this, this um, talk works really well if it's interactive. So, um, and I'm not sure how it works with the LSP. Is it is it is it easy for everyone to just to unmute and talk, or how how is the best way to make this kind of session interactive? Yeah, we can either do people can unmute themselves and talk, or I know sometimes people are logged in from NHS computers without mics, in which case um, there's also a chat box on the side, and um, so everyone should be able to pop messages in the chat box whether they've got a microphone or not. Okay, fine. So, so please, if if, if ever anyone feel free, there's no wrong or right answers here. So feel free to contribute to any of any of the questions that we ask or any suggestions. And if you don't understand something, I'm happy to go over it again. And if you have any comments in the comments book, Sarah, if you could just moderate that and, not, and put those questions to me if you see them come up. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds perfect. <clears throat> Great. So let's get started then. So we'll start. the objectives are we'll do some case studies and biochemical abnormalities in children. Um, and essentially, it's going to be divided into salt and water handling and some disorders of salt and water handling and acid-base balance. And um, just a review of some cases and then uh, an explanation of some of the pathophysiology behind those cases. So we can get started with case one. So this is a, um, consider this case of a baby boy born at 28 weeks gestation with aortic arch and bronchial abnormalities. He had a fun duplication. Um, this was considered because he had severe gastroesophageal reflux and he was failing to thrive. He was treated with domperidone, um, and Gaviscon, um, and you also needed feed supplements that contained glucose polymers, but continued to have failure to thrive. At five months old, he was acutely ill with a high fever, he had profuse diarrhea, he had an exacerbation of his vomiting, hypotonia, and poor perfusion on examination. And so this was his um, biochemistry, so he had some plasma electrolytes, as you can see, and then in the right-hand column, he had some urine electrolytes. Um, so can we just, from the audience, can we have some some of our um, trainee colleagues giving some ideas about how you'd interpret those, that biochemistry? What can you see? Any abnormalities, anything normal, anything you're worried about? Worried about the high sodium. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got a hypernatremia there. So we've got a sodium 162 millimoles per liter. Anything else? Low bicarb level. Yeah, so he's a bit of a low bicarbonate level. Yeah. It's a bit acidotic, maybe. Uremia. Yeah. So he's got he's he's got a uremia 10.9. What do you think of the osmolality, the plasma osmolality in particular? So I guess maybe maybe we go one step back. What's the normal plasma osmolality um, in, in normal physiology? So normally we say about 290 to 300 millimoles per kilogram. So that's uh, the kind of osmolality range. So he's a bit a bit of a high osmolality there. But we'll interpret that further with a urine osmolality in, in, in a short while. Um, but so so this is essentially a case of um, hypernatremia. Um, and so um, what, what, the, what are the causes of hypernatremia in, in infants and children? What the, what's the most likely cause of hypernatremia in a child? Dehydration. Yeah, dehydration. So the vast majority of cases are dehydration. So, so that's what we what kind of what we'd be thinking about for most children that present with this kind of story of vomiting um, and uh, hyponatremia. And and you can see that there's an elevated urea as well a little bit. So I just want you to keep that case in mind. And I want to bring to you another case, and um, we'll come back to both and compare both cases together. So this is a case of a seven-year-old boy with severe colitis. He underwent a colostomy and received intravenous and exogastric nutrition for five years. He presented twice with confusion, hyponatremia, 
um, but no fever, diarrhea or vomiting. And this is this young man's um, biochemistry. So can you, you can probably agree that quite similar bloods, if you have a, if you, um, if you can see that the sodium is 155 mils per liter, the previous one was 160 something. Um, and the osmolality is similarly high for osmolality, 320 mils per liter. So um, I put them both together, case one and case two, from both stories. I, I can tell you that one of these cases is a case of um, too little water dehydration. One of these cases is a case of too much salt, so a case of salt poisoning. Um, and it's really important as, as nephrologists, but also as general pediatricians, when they present to your emergency departments with hypernatremia, they were able to do some of the basic history taking and some of the basic initial investigations to be able to differentiate between the two. So looking at those two cases, what, what do you think? Um, who would, which one of these would you say is salt poisoning and which one would you say is dehydration? And if you go back to case one, was this case of a preterm infant with gastroesophageal reflux in case two, it's a child with colitis that had a colectomy and some TPN. So both of them have gastrointestinal problems. And, and I guess the next question is what kind of further information would you want? Because there's some bit of information I've not given to you. What else would you want to try and deduce from, from clinically? Any other information you'd like to know to differentiate between the two? A high urea would make me think about dehydration. Yeah, it's so definitely high urea. But it's not it's not stonkingly high, it's a 10.9. But it, and it, they could have an underlying chronic kidney disease as well. But yeah, you'd you'd think it could be, it's, it's a bit more suspicious that the urea in case two is, is normal. Not, not the absolute differential here, but a bit of a, a, bit of a clue, I'm sure. Um, I think the, the first one is the dehydration because the sodium in the urine is lower, I mean lower, um, and basically the state trying to get the sodium back to get the water back mm -hmm. in comparison to the second one yeah. where the sodium is high in the urine which means it's a high sodium. So we're, talking about, we're talking about urine okay. now aren't we? and so and when interpreting it, yes you're right you can see that the sodium in case two has a very elevated urinary sodium 172 mils but that's difficult to interpret alone without thinking about the creatinine level in the urine and, and we, we need to calculate something called a fractional excretion so we'll come back to that in a second but yeah important to look at the urinary sodium the uh, the first one has got a lower urinary sodium than the second but by that by itself doesn't mean too much we need to think about that as a fractional excretion of sodium um christine escaf you you put down that the second case seems to be very able to excrete sodium in the urine as the levels are very high so yeah again thinking about the urine sodium here is important yeah, I'm going to get some, before we go into urine, I'm, I'm going to suggest one more piece of vital clinical information is thinking about the weight of the child. Has there been any change in their weight? These children are both under medical services for their, their complex medical backgrounds, so they'll have regular weight checks. Um, and in case one, um, you can see that they had lost 10% of their body weight. And in case two, they gained four kilograms over the last month. So already, I think it's quite, does that make it more obvious with that simple piece of information about which one was salt poisoned and which one's dehydrated? Yes, the baby is dehydrated. Yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah, so, so I think a really vital part of any kind of assessment for a child with hypernatremia is the thinking about the weight and have they lost weight? I think if they have lost weight, compared to a previous consultation or appointment or in compared to their red book, then you can be relatively reassured that this child is dehydrated um, and is likely to be a, a dehydration related hyponatremia. However, it's very suspicious if they are very hyponatremic um, without any signs of acute kidney injury and are gaining weight progressively, they're very excessive weight gain. Um, so four kilograms over the last month for that child who um, has already got colitis is, is, is suspicious. And that would fit in 
with the case of salt poisoning. And then lastly, I want to talk about the fractional excretion. So looking at the plasma creatinine and sodium and the urinary plasma, it's urinary sodium creatinine, you can calculate the fractional excretion. And if it's below 1%, you know that these kidneys are trying to conserve sodium. So in case one, with a fractional excretion of 0.42%, which is below 1%, that child is dehydrated, trying to conserve sodium, trying to conserve water by extension. Um, and, and so that again is fit in with dehydration. You can see in case two, that there's an excess of sodium in this child. They, their fractional excretion is 2%, so it's way above 1%. And they're trying to, the kidneys are working hard to, to get rid of excess sodium, but it's not, not succeeding in excreting enough sodium to keep that plasma sodium normal. Um, so in this case, you have a, a child which is being salt poisoned. So very interesting, these are based on real cases. And very interestingly, it was case one that was accused, the, the parents of case one that was accused of salt poisoning. And it was the parents of case two that, that presented two or three times with, with hyponatremic episodes without being suspected of salt poisoning. Um, it was only on review of these cases where it was realized that they'd got it the wrong way around. Um, so really important to be able to consider these clinical scenarios. And I think one of the most important things to try and remember when managing a child with hyponatremia is to try and get some urines earlier before treating, before giving them water or giving them intravenous IV fluids. Um, because what you'd, it would be very helpful for the, uh, for the assessment of fraction excretions to get um, original urine and blood paired urine and plasma levels before any treatment so that we can see what the kidneys were doing at that time and then this is the uh, calculation that you can and you can screen grab this or write this down this is the calculation for fraction excretion for paired electrolytes for any electrolyte it doesn't have to be sodium it could be potassium um, or calcium magnesium any any when you want to calculate the fraction excretion of any electrolyte and um, this is the formula for that so that's a bit of hypernatremia. Any questions about that? Is that clear? Oh, very good. Excellent. So we'll go on. We'll go on to the next case now. So case three. So this is a ex preterm infant, thirty three week gestation, uh, male infant. He had a late an antenatally late onset polyhydramnios, um, and a renal ultrasound scan in the first week of life was normal after birth. Um, we also had a hyperkalemia in the first week with elevated creatinine, um, unexplained, and that self-resolved. Um, and they lost 15% of their birth weight and required quite a lot of fluid, 220 mils per kilo per day of fluid at one stage in order to, to get on top of weight gain and, and the creatinine. At day seven, the plasma osmolality was 315, the urine osmolality was 314. And they did a, they did a short synactin test in, in ICU. We showed a good response to synactin, their cortisol levels. So they deemed that this baby had normal adrenal function. And was discharged and was 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 left to the outside world and um, was doing generally okay, but had been noted to be polydipsic and polyuric, with um, failure to fry, poor weight gain. Um, some more information um, had norm, normal calcium levels in their blood, but high calcium creatinine ratio. Incidentally, an ultrasound scan of the renal tract shows medullary nephrocalcinosis with hypercalcemia. Um, and so this is their gas. You can see the gas is generally unremarkable. So the pH of 7.44, a bicarb of 25.8, and a base excess of 1.7. And the plasma electrolytes, sodium 144, potassium of 3.4, urea of 6.6, .6, and a creatinine of 22. So generally, again, largely unremarkable. I wouldn't myself care too much about these kind of blood results. Um, plasma osmolality was generally normal, a bit, a bit on the high side, but not, not extremely so, with 304. Um, and the urine osmolality was less than 200, but nothing worrying in this context because they had normal electrolytes. Um, 
magnesium 0.9, phosphate 1.7, albumin 45. Um, so because of the poly, so what we have essentially is a child with polyuria and polydipsia, failure to thrive, and also incidentally some medullary nephrocalcinosis. There's something, maybe some kind of tube lopathy that we can't fully understand. Um, they did a water deprivation test. Um, and so why would we do a water deprivation test? What are we trying to diagnose with a water deprivation test? Can anyone tell me? Diabetes insipidus to figure out yeah. whether it's the brain or the kidneys that aren't working. Absolutely, yeah. So they were trying to figure out, is this because they, they, they figured out that this polyurid polydipsy was nothing to do with diabetes mellitus, they had normal blood sugar. So was this because of a problem with vasopressin? Was it a uh, problem with the nephrogenic DI or was it a central DI? They did the water deprivation tests and they determined that the urine volumes um, did reduce when they deprived them of water and the urine osmolality was able to rise above that of the plasma osmolality towards the end of the test. So they had an, had an intact ability of, of concentrating the urine, intact urine concentrating mechanism. Um, so they, the child didn't have diabetes insipidus. So they've done a, they've done quite a few tests. They've done short snacking tests, which is normal. They've done a water deprivation test, which is normal. They've got a child here with nephrocalcinosis. They can't explain why. But generally, if you have a, if you have nephrocalcinosis from hypercalcemia, you can try thiazide diuretics, and that can sometimes help improve the nephrocalcinosis. So it's not an uncommon thing for nephrologists to do to to treat with a trial of thiazides. So I just wanted to show you the blood gas. This is the blood gases before the trial of thiazides. And this is the blood gas um, after the thiazide. So, um, so something's happened after starting a thiazide. What do you think? What do you think is going on? What can we comment about that gas? And you don't need to tell me the diagnosis, or you can if you like. But um, if, if anyone has a diagnosis, let me know. But it could also just be great for people to describe what they think is wrong with the gas. There is metabolic alkalosis. Yeah, it's so a metabolic alkalosis, definitely. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and, and I've got Ash thinks a hypokalemia as well, and query Barter syndrome. Yep, so Bartos syndrome is a very good shout. Also a hyponatremia as well and a hypochloremia. Yep, so um, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis is usually the, the hallmark of Bartos syndrome, especially with a, with a hypokalemia as well. So that would fit in with Bartos syndrome. And, and this is in fact Bartos syndrome. And, and if you did the paired electrolytes, with this patient, you would see that this patient had a fractional excretion potassium of 18%, which, um, and, and you have to bear in mind, how do we interpret fractional excretions of potassium? So I've got here some 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 values of less than 10% fractional of potassium is low and more than 30% is high. So this is somewhere in the middle, 18%. But if you think about this child with a potassium of 2.4, so very low plasma potassium levels, the fractional excretion of potassium, if the kidneys were working normally, should be very, very low. These kidneys should be working hard to preserve potassium as much as possible and 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 waste as little as possible, a very low fractional excretions. But the fact that it's as high as 18% in the context of having a hypokalemia at 2.4, this would we consider this, this to be an abnormally high fractional excretion of potassium. And you can say with confidence that the potassium is being wasted in the urine and not from anywhere else like the gut or something like that. So again, more evidence here that we have a um, salt wasting disorder in the kidneys, a potassium wasting disorder in the kidneys, which again would fit most likely with Barter syndrome. Um, so, so yes, this is Barter syndrome. Does th does anyone have any questions about that that presentation or the, because it's not it's not an, it's not a usual presentation, is it? Normally, the biochemistry is quite obvious. And it was only after starting a thiazide that it became obvious what this diagnosis was. Um, does anyone have any? Can anyone tell me what Barter syndrome is or a bit of information about what's happening in the tubules with Barter syndrome? Yeah, 
Mm. Okay, so shall I just, uh, what, what I'll do, I wanted to just spend, spend the next couple of minutes talking about the pathophysiology of Barter syndrome, what's happening in the tubules, why it happens, and why we get those blood tests, the biochemistry presenting like it does. And I, thought, I think the first thing to mention is that Barter syndrome is a disorder of sodium handling, it's a disorder of salt handling, yet yeah, as trainees, um, as physicians, pediatricians, we're always learning about the hypokalemia. We never really concentrate on the sodium. It's quite a curiosity that this is a genetic condition which affects sodium handling, yet the potassium is always low. And that tells you about something about how the kidneys handle salt and the priorities of salt handling over the handling of other electrolytes such as um, potassium. And I guess the, the, the message I want to send you home with today is that um, sodium is the most important electrolyte in our bloods. So that when you look at the, the, the renal function come back from any child's blood test, the most important thing to a child's or an adult's health and survival is having um, normal sodium levels, having good homeostasis of our sodium. Because of course with sodium comes our water and fluid balance. Um, and our bodies are very good at um, maintaining sodium levels at all costs, even when when our kidneys are not functioning properly and we have advanced chronic kidney disease, we can still maintain good sodium levels. Um, and even when we have problems with our tubules and tubular dysfunction resulting in, in parts of the tubules not working, we can still compensate and maintain normal sodium levels. Um, and, and and just as another example of that, you can say that what's the, can anyone tell me what's the highest sodium level they've seen in a clinical context in a patient survive? And what's the lowest sodium you've seen in a clinical context and survive? So someone's put in some summaries, but 179, 167, 181, 118, yeah, so these are very extreme levels. Um, I've seen lower and higher, um, and I've, I'm always fascinated by how much the body can be pushed. I've seen a sodium of 97 before. Um, but if a normal sodium is 140, then um, we'd say that if something, for example, 160, 170 is we consider too high to be safe, then we're only about 20, 30% above the normal level of sodium. Whereas, can everyone tell me what the highest potassium is and the lowest potassium that you've seen? So 9.7 and 2.1, exactly. So um, so you can see that the potassium can rise by 100% its normal or drop by 100% of its normal level. Far more, uh, as in percentage terms, higher and lower levels of potassium that our bodies can tolerate compared to sodium. So if our sodium rises by 20% its normal level in plasma, we worry a lot about our, uh, our ability to survive that whereas potassium can go up to 100% before we start worrying about um, myocardial impacts of hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. So our bodies know this, our bodies know that we can adapt much better to low potassium or high potassium in comparison to that very um, important electrolyte sodium where we need to keep it more strictly in control. So I want to just go a bit more into the physiology of salt handling. So and this is all, of course, tubular function. We're talking about the, the part of the nephron, which is after the glomerulus. So the proximal tubules, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. Um, um, these tubules will handle 180 liters of filtrate every day. So that's how much, if you have a GFR of 100 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, the average adult will filter 180 liters of filtrate every day. And if your sodium is 140 millimoles per liter, that's equivalent to about 1.1 um, kilograms of sodium chloride that are being um, processed by our tubules um, and 425 grams of bicarbonate and 145 grams of sugar. So there's a huge amount of salt and sugar and electrolytes which are being filtered and then therefore reabsorbed. About 99% of our sodium is reabsorbed into our tubules. Um, and um, that remaining 1% is excreted and it can be titrated up and down, depending on if you have sodium or salt excess or water um, excess or not. 
or, or dehydration. So that's how, I'd, and, and and then if you look at this, uh, this nephron, I'm sure you'll recognize that from your physiology days, um, about 70% of our sodium is reabsorbed in a proximal tubule, and about 20% is reabsorbed in the a thick ascending limb in the loop of Henley, distal convoluted tubule, about 7% of our sodium is reabsorbed there, and then the remaining few percent is reabsorbed in our collecting ducts. And of course, every um, part of the um, nephron can become dysfunctional due to various genetic disorders, and each one has a syndrome associated with it. You can say Fanconi syndrome in the proximal tubule, Barter syndrome in the thick ascending limb. We've heard of Gittelman syndrome, which is a disorder of the distal conv uh, uh, convoluted tubules. Um, and pseudo-hypodostrinism in the um, collecting ducts. So all of these can affect sodium handling and sodium reabsorption. However, in all of these conditions, what we normally see is a normal plasma sodium level. So our bodies somehow have a way of being able to compensate of preserving sodium homeostasis despite having dysfunction in these vital areas of the tubules, which are responsible for sodium reabsorption. So I'm going to focus now on Barter syndrome, which is on the thick ascending limb. Now remember, the thick ascending limb is responsible for a very hefty 20% of our sodium reabsorption. Um, and can everyone see my mouse, by the way? Is that something, if I use that as a pointer, is that something you can all see? Yes, we can see it. Yes, Great. I can see um, it. So what, what I'm showing you here is a cell in the thick ascending limb. And this is a um, very important um, co-transporter of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And this allows, th this facilitates the uptake from the, from the tubule into the basolateral part, into the bloodstream, um, the movement of uh, reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride. And this is a, um, a transporter which is, which needs all of these to coincide and be transported together. The rate limiting step of this transporter, the thing that slows it down, is a deficiency of potassium um, in the tubule. So this is why we have this particular channel here called the ROMK channel. And ROMK allows for potassium to be recycled back out into the tubule, um, uh, into the lumen of the tubule, um, allowing for the continued the um, movement of sodium chloride and potassium back through this channel, through the NKCC2 channel. This whole process is powered with energy using the, the sodium potassium ATPase pump, where sodium is pumped into the blood and potassium is pumped back out into the cell, providing um, an abundance of potassium to allow for, for potassium to pass through the K channel. So the energy that's consumed, the, the, the mitochondria in these cells um, are providing um, energy for this particular pump. And then here we have a channel to allow through passive diffusion, the, uh, the reabsorption of chloride into our bloodstream. And this is called the Bactrin protein, which also allows for this channel to work properly. Incidentally, furosemide acts on the NKCC2 pump and it inhibits this, it will antagonize this, and, and that's how furosemide works. We can stop sodium, potassium, and chloride from being reabsorbed, allow for an excess of sodium to be delivered into our, to the lumens of our tubules and to collecting ducts, and therefore, wherever salt goes, water will follow. So if you're excreting more salt from your urine, you're going to be excreting more water, and that's how we use furosemide as a diuretic. Um, but furosemide also mimics the effects of Barter's type 1. So Barter's type 1 is where you have a, um, a genetic knockout of this particular um, NKCC2 channel. And Barter's type 2 is where you have a problem with the ROMK channel. Um, and then Barter's type 3 is where you've lost the CLCNKB um, transporter for chloride. And Barter's type 4 is where you've where you don't have this Bactrin um, co-transporter. I've got here at the bottom magnesium and calcium as well, because through paracellular channels called Claudin channels, magnesium and calcium can be transported 
um, from the the tubule of the lumen into the uh, into the bloodstream, and this occurs due to the biochemical gradient, sorry, the electrochemical gradient of potassium excess in this area. So the positive charge from all this potassium will allow positively charged ions such as magnesium and calcium to be pushed through um, electrochemically into through the paracellular channels. Now, if if this system is not working, if the ROMK is knocked out or the NKCC2 is not working, then you don't have that excess of potassium here and therefore this electrochemical gradient is lost. And so therefore we can't, we can't reabsorb, especially in particular calcium very well. And so you get the nephrocalcinosis in some phenotypes in Barter syndrome um, and you get the hypercalciuria. Um, so if you have a Barter syndrome and, you're, and anyone asks you, oh, why do they have nephrocalcinosis as well? This is why the whole mechanism is involved, not just in salt handling, but also is responsible for how we transport calcium back into our bloodstream. Um, so that's an explanation. And, and what we can see here is that you can imagine here you get an, an, an excess delivery into our distal and collect distal convolutules and, and collecting tubules, an excess of sodium and water. And so what are the clinical characteristics of Barter syndrome? So in neonatal or classical Barter's, you get polyhydramnios, polyuria and polydipsia is a common feature, nephrocalcinosis, as we mentioned, failure to thrive, and they can have normal or low blood pressures. Um, and if untreated, they can rarely develop into renal failure as well. Um, in some cases of Barter's syndrome, they're much more mild and they can present later um, in life usually with failure to thrive and abnormal biochemistry. So I haven't yet we haven't yet talked about why these patients become hypokalemic. So we've talked about the, the problem here in the thick ascending limb where sodium essentially cannot be reabsorbed. That'll explain why they're polyuric, polydipsic. Why do they have, first of all, normal sodium biochemistry and hypokalemia with a normal blood pressure in most cases. How, how does that happen? Because of course sodium is vital for normal blood pressure regulation. How do we compensate? Does anyone know? Yeah, so Ash has written aldosterone, absolutely. So we have we have um, hyperanemic hyperaldosteronism. So we have juxtacomerular cells in our kidneys which can sense low sodium um, and, and a low circulating volume, and therefore we release renin when we have low salt levels and a low circulating volume, which leads on to the release of aldosterone. And aldosterone works in the collecting duct, and we have two types of cells in the collecting we have principal cells and intercalated cells, and these are alternating cells down the, down the length of that collecting duct. And when you have aldosterone in excess attaching itself to the molar alicorticoid receptors, that causes an upregulation of these channels called ENAC channels um, and potassium ROMK channels. So this will allow this excess of sodium to be therefore, because we're, we're delivering excess sodium to the collecting tubules, this will be reabsorbed into the cell and have an excess of potassium in its place. Um, and then also aldosterone causes um, an upregulation of this particular cat channel, the AE1 channel, allowing for the reabsorption of bicarbonate. And that therefore leads to more potassium, uh, sorry, not potassium, hydrogen being excreted um, into the into the tubule of the lumen, into the lumen of the tubule, and so that's why we get a um, an alkalotic picture, a hypokalemia, a hypokalemia with a metabolic alkal alkalosis, because of the effects of aldosterone um, to to compensate for the hyponatremia. So we we can conserve sodium in this way using a different part of the tubule. If the thick ascending limb is not working. Uh, and not reabsorbing sodium, we can upregulate other parts of the tubule to allow for better reabsorption of sodium, but at the expense of potassium and hydrogen, causing a metabolic al alkalosis. 
and hyperkalemia. Does, it, does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any um, questions about that? It sounds it's, it sounds a bit of a mouthful to get to to get your heads around it, but um, I hope that makes sense. Does anyone want me to re-explain re some of that? So how can we treat um, Bartism? Oh, so we've got a question. How does the hydrogen get pushed out help reabsorption of sodium? So it's not so much, it doesn't help with the reabsorption of sodium, Joe. Good question. It's more of a byproduct of an upregulation. It's more of a byproduct of, of excessive aldosterone. So aldosterone causes the upregulation of not just these channels, the ENAC channels and the potassium channels, it also causes an upregulation of this AE1 transporter, which allows for the reabsorption of bicarbonate excess reabsorption, if you like, of bicarbonate into the blood. And then, um, therefore, any this um, this is carbonic anhydrase, which exists in our intercalated cells. And um, this will, this is an enzyme which facilitates the production of bicarbonate and hydrogen from water and carbon dioxide. And this is um, based this is this is an equation which is in constant equilibrium. If you have an excess or a deficiency in either side of that equation, it will push it to the other side. So if you have, for example, um, a deficient, if you have um, an excess uptake of bicarbonate into the blood, you're gonna you're gonna push this um, the excess production of bicarbonate in the intercalated cell, um, and you can produce more hydrogen ions and more bicarbonate ions to be then reabsorbed. Um, and then those excess hydrogen ions uh, as a byproduct of that would be excreted. That's a very good question. So, um, so in terms of treatment, um, we can use various different treatments for Bartos syndrome. I would prefer in the medicine, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, these counteract polyuria, um, by um, through their inhibition of prostaglandins, which is a mechanism by which we um, uh, use excess water. Um, and in some cases, although this isn't usually recommended, um, but it can be used in some cases where you can use potassium sparing diuretics, such as amylorhydrospironolactone. You have to use those with caution though, because they are inhibiting some of the compensatory mechanisms um for salt conservation and they can have much more brittle control of their sodium which is more of an emergency than hypokalemia which can be also treated with potassium supplementation so they need a high salt diet um delivering them more salt in a diet because it's a salt wasting condition will help um, so they'll need sodium supplementation and usually potassium supplementation as well important to note that we're not trying to aim for normal potassium levels. We're, we're aiming for just safe potassium levels. So these children have had potassiums of less than, in some cases, 2.5 for many years before being diagnosed. It would be far more dangerous to try and correct that to a potassium of four or five um, and double the potassium level in a short space of time than it would be just to leave it at that level where their myocardiums have already adapted to that and to gently try and give them some potassium supplementation and push it to closer towards three. But we're not aiming for normal potassium levels. It doesn't even have to be above three as long as it's not getting lower and it's um, and they don't have any obvious um, uh, symptoms or myocardial changes on ECG. So yeah, we just mentioned that replacing potassium cautiously is important and avoiding rapid changes. In some, in Gittelman syndrome, so this is not particularly for Bartos syndrome, but it's a similar condition. We, they can become hypomagnesemic, um, and we need to correct the hypomagnesemia as well. And just to touch base on Gittelman syndrome, um, whereas the when Bartos syndrome is a problem of the thick ascending limb and loop of Henle, this um, in the Gittelman syndrome, um, sodium is reabsorbed through the NCC transporter. Um, in the distal convoluted tubule cells, um, and um, it's a genetic mutation of that transporter, which means we, we cannot 
transport sodium through the distal corneal tubule. Um, and that can also lead to hypermagnesemia and hypercalciuria, although not fully understood why um, some of the mechanisms still to be explained. Um, this is also the the um, the transporter which um, the thiazide diuretics act upon. So Gitterman syndrome is the mirror of using a thiazide. They do the, they do the same thing. You can um, you can consider Barter syndrome type one as being frusamide or loop diuretics and the the mechanism of action and Gitterman syndrome being identical to the mechanism of action of thiazide diuretics, which antagonize the NCC transporter proteins. So if we go back to our case, why did this boy with Barter syndrome, who had previously relatively normal biochemistry, you can see here, when he gave him a thiazide diuretic, why did he suddenly become much more bartery? Why did he develop a hyponatremia as well as more hypokalemia and, um, and alkalosis? Yes. Maybe he was compensating with the other mechanism and then took it away. Yeah, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. So prior to all of this, he was um, he had a genetic condition which resulted in 20% um, of his salt handling ability being reduced. Um, and he would have been using other parts of his nephron to compensate. And what we've done with the thiazides just made things worse. We've taken away another 7% of his salt handling ability. Um, and sodium reabsorption, and, and therefore that was the point where we tipped him over the edge, and um, he wasn't able to compensate any longer. He was also a little bit dehydrated, um, which helped keep some of that biochemistry a bit more normal in terms of the higher so the potassium levels. Um, so that's a good example of how um, Bart uh, Barter syndrome can present, how they can compensate to start with, but how we can also make things worse by um, but not understanding exactly what's going on, um, causing a, a decompensation and a, and a presentation of a, of a clear and frank Barter syndrome. Does anyone have any questions about that, or any 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 questions about Barter syndrome in general? Okay, I've got two more cases, so we'll try and get through these relatively quickly. Um, uh, and please feel free to, uh, to to put any questions in the chat screen. So the case four is a 14-month boy, old boy with persistent vomiting. He had a previous diagnosis of gastroesophageal reflux. I think every kidney patient has previously been diagnosed with GORD. So just a reminder there that um, a child that's vomiting and failing to thrive may have other things, not just gastroesophageal reflux. And um, they presented multiple times to GP and pediatric a &E parents have been labeled as anxious. Um, but they're always, this is the this is the uh, the big problem for these particular patients that they're, they're always reassured um, as he's always had wet nappies and or, and he parents say that oh, he's got very full nappies, needing nappy changes every three hours. So it really catches us out as pediatricians because the first question we ask a, um, ask a parent in an A&E setting when they've got a vomiting child and we're trying to assess whether they're hydrated or not is, do you wet your nappies or do you have wet nappies? And if the answer is yes, we can be reassured by that. But I guess the red flag here was that this child has also dropped two centiles. And, and at some point the child, um, he was looking particularly bad one day and had some laboratory investigations and sodium was 152. Um, urine, um, sodium was 24 millimoles per liter, osmolality is 334. So this is deemed to be a slightly dehydrated child um, with, um, with hypernatremia. And then the child was um, started on some IV fluids um, and was waiting a ward bed in A&E. And as these things happen, sometimes it takes a long time to move these children to the ward. Um, so um, uh, six to eight hours later, it was still in the pediatric assessment unit awaiting a bed on the ward, but was looking a bit more irritable and um, not himself, parents again, more anxious. Another blood gas um, was performed, showed a sodium now of 169 millimoles per litre. 
still very wet nappies also. So what's happening with this child? Can anyone give us a give us a, an impression? So Davy said diabetes and symptoms. Everyone's saying diabetes and symptoms. Very good. So can anyone justify it? Tell me why you think it's DI. So ADH would stop you peeing, and because they don't have enough ADH, they're peeing a lot. Yeah, exactly. So they're, they're, they are um, essentially unable to concentrate their urine. They, they may be dehydrated or not having enough water intake, but, um, but they are passing just far too much urine and not able to concentrate it to a point where and reduce um, and they can't limit their water loss. They keep losing water and therefore becoming hyponatremic. So this child is now getting a bit worse. They're lethargic. Their blood pressure is low. They're tachycardic with a heart rate 164. And they're peripherally quite cool now. So starting to show a few signs of shock. So what would you do next? Would anyone like to offer? You're the a &E SHO or registrar. IV fluids slowly, Ash. What, which IV fluids would you use, Ash? <laughs> we'll discuss. Like, you're not allowed to say that now in a teaching session. But yeah, I'm glad you would discuss with a with a senior nephrologist or something. But yeah, if you had to choose Ash, what and what IV fluids would you choose? Uh, maybe like. 0.45% saline. Okay, 0.45% saline, yep. Why is that? Because they've already got a high sodium, so they don't want to give them lots more sodium to make yeah. things worse. What's the, what's the problem here? Why have they got high sodium there? Because they're passing too much urine. Yeah, so is it an excess of salt or is it a deficiency of water? Deficiency of water. Yeah. So, for example, if this was a child that didn't have DI, that just was in a &E with a gastroenteritis, what would you give them? With the same, with that same hyponatremia. 0.9% saline and 5% dextrose. Yeah, you'd give them a 0.9%. You'd probably give them a bolus when you, they're in shock. You would give them a bolus of 0.9% saline. Yeah, um, fine. And I think, so this child received, um, two boluses of 0.9% saline, um, each bolus 20 mils per kilo. Um, and it's a 10 kilo child, so 400 mils essentially of 0.9% saline. And then they rechecked re the, the sodium and the sodium was now 193 millimoles per litre, proper heart sink moment for any um, pedi pediatrician in that kind of um, emergency setting that whatever we're doing, things are just getting worse. Became unresponsive, had a respiratory arrest, and was intubated and ventilated. So what was happening here? Why is this patient, despite our efforts, getting worse and worse and developed a very, very quickly a severe hyponatremia? Anyone? There's no right. There's hyponatremic seizure. Yeah, absolutely. But why? Why have they developed hyponatremic seizure? Everyone said this. Pa this patient has diabetes insipidus. So why has this managed to happen? Yep, cerebral edema. I guess all the water we're giving him actually is going out. So just giving more sodium, but it's not able to retain the water. Yeah, I think so. You're on the right tracks here. So unable, so tax said, said unable to excrete the sodium load. We're giving them. You're absolutely right. So that's that's essentially the essence of it. In diabetes insipidus, um, they're unable to concentrate their urine. So if you're not able to concentrate your urine, the volume of water you're giving, you're not. If you're not able to excrete that level of sodium as well with that, if you can't concentrate the urine with excess with extra sodium. You're going to you're going to increase your sodium plasma levels and and develop hyperinsulinemia very quickly. So these children cannot handle any kind of osmotic load. 
and, and, and the, the, the osmotic load here is sodium. So you give them an osmotic load to that extent, um, 400 mils of 0.9% saline, then you're giving them such a huge salt load that they cannot handle that they're going to become very hyponatremic. So the number one rule here for patients with diabetes symptoms is not to give them salt. They, we should always try and avoid that. What this child needed was just water. They are wasting only water. They need, they're not able to handle salt. And should have just these children always need free access to water. Um, and if they, if for whatever reason they cannot have oral water, because the best way to manage them is just let them drink. They can regulate their own um, uh, plasma osmolality very well. We have very sensitive osmoreceptors. Um, which can can titrate the amount of water we need. Um, but if they for whatever reason cannot do that by themselves, then we, we can give them intravenous IV glucose without salt. They just need water. And I want to go a bit into this pathophysiology about DI and, and water handling in our bodies. Um, so this is... Um, how we handle water. You can see here that this is a collecting duct cell um, and this is antidiuretic hormone or, or vasopressin. So when we have, when our brains detect um, an elevated osmolality and elevated plasma osmolality, we release from our pituitary gland antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. Um, um, oh. Oh, let me do it. So Jodie doesn't need a cannula because she's got ports. The nurses will do that. Oh, sorry, everyone. Just remind everyone to mute if you can. Um, so present acts upon our collecting duct cells, um, and it upregulates these messenger signals to to allow the release of aquaporin uh, molecules into the uh, into the membrane of our collecting duct cells. And this facility allows the, the collecting tubule cells to essentially become permeable to water. So prior to this, they were impermeable to water, now they're permeable to water. And the medullary interstitial fluid in the collecting ducts is very high for osmosis, 600 milliosmols. Yeah, and this allows through osmosis, the, the, the passing of, of water from the once impermeable to the now permeable collecting duct cell mem um, membranes. Um, and, and that way we can conserve water. And this is a, um, a very important mechanism for salvaging water. And we can titrate this up and down. So if we have an excess of water, if our plasma osmolality is low, we won't produce vasopressin. There'll be no aquaporin channels um, inserted into the membrane and water will therefore just pass through the collecting tubules and will produce more urine so that we can excrete the excess urine. As I said, if we're feeling particularly dry and our osmolality goes up, our brain's very sensitive, can sense this and release vasopressin so that we can reabsorb more water through the collecting tubules. Um, and this is how we handle water. And a disorder of this process is called diabetes insipidus and that can be because of a central cause because we're not producing antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin because of a because of a pituitary gland problem or it could be because of a um a genetic condition in our kidneys called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which don't respond to the vasopressin because we have a defect in the receptors um and we're particularly here concentrating on the nephrogenic form they present similarly but normally the, the, the treatment for the central form is just to give them a synthetic antidiuretic hormone, whereas we can't do that um, in the nephrogenic form. And then just to go through, um, this is a very fascinating, this is a very uniquely mammalian trait to be able to conserve water like we do. So I just wanted to again go through it, just to go through a bit of a segue here and to, to introduce you to this particularly interesting type of fish. This fish existed uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, and it was discovered from fossil records to be the first um, freshwater vertebrates. So this was a vertebrate found in freshwater and therefore deduced to be our ancestors. We have all, all land animals have evolved from this fish called an ostracoderm. 
and it's called an ostracoderm because it's very heavily armored. Um, they were very curious paleontologists as to why a fish would be so heavily armored when there was nothing bigger than it, nothing that was around that could have eaten it really. Um, and this fish came from um, the salty sea into a freshwater environment. So can um, can anyone give me a out of interest a guess as to why this fish has armor when there's nothing there to eat it? So the reason is, is that um, in the sea, vertebrates, the uh, primitive vertebrates had an abundance of salt, an abundance of water, and didn't need particularly complex water conservation or salt conservation mechanisms. They had an excess of salt and water by just opening their mouth and gulping in the seawater, and just needed uh, primitive tubules that would just excrete excess salt and water. Whereas suddenly when this fish went into a freshwater source, there was suddenly a, um, a very dangerous hypotonic external environment, which would have, if, um, if any of those primitive seawater vertebrates went into those hypotonic environments, they would, um, they would have an influx of water going into their intracellular compartments, causing them to essentially explode, much like we have cerebral edema from that osmotic difference between the blood brain barrier um, and our neuronal cells. So these fish had this evolutionary advantage of having armor making their skin impermeable to water and that was the first way of being able to tackle that hypotonic environment and that gave these fish the ability to swim in fresh water and eventually to land up on land to crawl out onto land um and tackle their next big evolutionary challenge which was how do we manage to conserve salt and water in an environment on land when we don't have a constant supply of water so tubules had to develop and kidneys had to develop um, in order to be able to conserve salt and water in particular water and so the peak of this evolution is mammalian kidney evolution and there's something very unique about mammalian kidneys is that mammals are the only animals, so reptiles can't do this, birds can't do this, amphibians can't do this, but mammals are the only animals which can concentrate their urine to a level that's more concentrated than their plasma. So I just want you to think about that. We can conserve water to such an extent that we can concentrate urine to a level that's more concentrated than mammals. So for example, the maximum concentrating ability of a human kidney is that we can concentrate our urine um, to have an osmolality of 1000 to 1200, when our plasma osmolality is about 300. So about three to four times our plasma osmolality. And that conservation of urine, sorry, that conservation of water and that ability to concentrate urine allows us to go for prolonged periods of time without having a constant supply of water and yet keep our plasma osmolality normal. This kangaroo rat is the peak of evolution in that it can concentrate its urine to 17 times its plasma osmolality, meaning that this rat can live in arid deserts without drinking any water, it can get all of its water that it needs from the food that it consumes, which are essentially insects, and any water that has in its food is enough to keep this, this rat hydrated enough to keep an osmolality level of 295 to 300. So um, what we have in diabetes insipidus is a loss of that mammalian feature of being able to concentrate our urine and up to above our plasma level. And therefore we become fully dependent on a constant supply of water. And I just want to discuss a little bit about the tonicity balance, the issue with this particular patient, why this patient became so hypernatremic. So if you remember, we gave this patient a bolus of 0.4 liters of water. And because we gave him a bolus of 0.4 liters of water and he's got no ability to concentrate his urine, he cannot conserve water, he's going to excrete exactly 0.4 liters or 400 mils of urine. We gave him, 100, we gave him 400 mils of 0.9% um, saline which is 62 millimoles of sodium. If you consider that 0.9% is 154 millimoles per liter, 
And then if you look at the, um, if you go back to the um, the urine um, sodium level, it was 34 millimoles per litre. That was the maximum amount of sodium this child could excrete in their urine in with, with this condition, diabetes and symptoms, because they couldn't concentrate their urine any further than 34 millimoles per litre. So if all they can excrete is 34 millimoles per litre, then in 400 mils of water, they can only excrete 14 millimoles of sodium. So in this situation, you have a you have a, a um, an imbalance in your tonicity levels. You have um, a, um, a the same amount of water being excreted as what's being given. So that's in equilibrium. But we have an excess of sodium. You cannot excrete any more sodium with that amount of salt load being given. And that's why this patient became hypernatremic. So in diabetes insipitus, when we're managing these patients, it's really important to try and get paired electrolytes as well um, and uh, look at their osmolalities. And that usually is enough to make the diagnosis if they're unable to concentrate their urine. Um, it's important to remember that, again, yes, we, we do water deprivation tests to diagnose these patients, but we shouldn't do them in patients which are already hyponatremic. Paired urines would be sufficient in patients which are hyponatremic. If the patient loses 3% of the body weight or the plasma osmolality is above 300, we should terminate the test. And they have to be very carefully monitored when doing a water deprivation test. And then, as we mentioned already earlier, DDAVP is used to determine if it's a central or nephrogenic cause if they're, if, they're, um, if they're able to concentrate their urine. After a dose of DDAVP, then we know that it's a central cause. If they're not able to concentrate their urine afterwards, then we know it's a uh, um, it's a uh, nephrogenic cause. So the management for nephrogenic DI is, is mostly dietary. We need to reduce that osmotic load by giving them a good amount of calories to grow, but reduce things which cause an excess osmotic load, which is essentially protein and salt. Thiazide diuretics can help, which is fascinating that a diuretic can help in a condition like DI. We can also use endomedicine like ibuprofen again, NSAIDs, to, to reduce, to, to help with the polyuria. She's got a message from Joe saying, in that patient, if you're giving just dextrose, do you risk causing cerebral edema by bringing down the sodium too quickly? Or do they self-regulate so well that you don't have to worry too much? It's a really good question, Joe, and, um, um, and, um, and something we should definitely worry about. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be advocating for quick changes in the sodium. What I would say about that patient is that within a, Within the course of a 12 hour period, the sodium iatrogenically was raised from the 150s, 160s, all the way up to 190s. So in, in that situation, um, bringing down the sodium relatively quickly wouldn't be as risky. The, the patients where you're at risk of cerebral edema is those patients that are hypernatremic um, for a very long, or hyponatremic for a very long period of time for maybe days, weeks, have been just about managing and then they they become unwell, come to hospital, and then you correct things quickly. So if you're if things are happening quickly and this patient is heading towards a seizure because of a sudden increase in sodium, then it wouldn't be so risky to reduce the sodium. But of course you cannot eliminate that risk. There there will always be a risk of um cerebral edema by bringing down the sodium too quickly and um and so yeah doing things judiciously and carefully is important. But um and the only way you can mitigate for that really is to um, try and first of all eliminate the cause of the hypernatremia, which is the excess salt that you're giving them, and to give them water, and then to do regular um, blood gases to check their sodium levels and make sure that you're not changing things very, very quickly, but also making sure that clinically they're not getting worse. Is that, is that satisfactory, Joe? So just as another example of when we talk about the dietary management of nephrogenic DI, if you think about a, a typical Western diet has about 500 milliosmoles of osmotic load per day to the kidney, 
And if our kidneys can only concentrate urine to a concentrating ability of 50 to 100 milliosmoles per kilogram, remember it should be in normal physiology up to 10 times higher than that in, in extreme cases. Um, then we'd need about five to 10 liters of fluid to excrete that load. So when we say free access to water, these patients really do need a huge amount of water. They need to have regular, lots of water bottles to drink and glug throughout the, in their classrooms. Um, and at night time as well, um, it makes it very hard for these children to be continent at night. And therefore reducing that osmotic load in the diet is helpful. So uh, renal dietitians are really important in managing this condition and being able to give them just enough protein to grow, but not too much that we um, increase their osmotic load. And of course, being really strict with salt restriction if we can. Otherwise, they'll be just obliged to continue drinking and drinking and drinking. Uh, an, an example, for example, is a, a um, if you went to a nice steak restaurant and I had the 200 grams um, uh, steak um, and seasoned it with two grams of salt, um, then that steak and salt would be about 800 milliosmoles per kilogram. And you'd need about nine liters of water to excrete that osmotic load provided by this meal. Um, so yeah, uh, just some of the things that these DI patients have to consider when when um, dealing with their diets. I know we're over time. I've got one more case. Um, would you like to go through that case or shall we call it a day? I'm happy with the consensus here. There's a yes, please. Um, and, and everyone is still on the call, so I assume people are up for it. Okay, well, um, if everyone, if, don't be obliged to listen. You can always drop off if you need to. So in last case, so this is a patient, 39 weeks gestation with, with no antenatal postnatal concerns, no no problems with the pregnancy, normal delivery, um, and was discharged quite quickly. Four weeks old, had started to difficulty breastfeeding, not gaining weight well. The birth weight was 3.05 kilograms. The weight at four weeks was 3.06 kilograms. So you can see in that month, the baby hasn't grown had a three-year-old sister with an upper respiratory tract infection, probably red herring, but developed worsening breathing for two days um, and not settling and was increasingly tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 66. Um, so this is the, um, you can see here the actual um, ambulance card. Um, and I just wanted to point out some of the things that are written here. So you can see here the sodium uh, was 138, potassium is 4.1, the chloride 118, um, and um, oh, the pH here is 6.98, and the bicarbonate is 4.4, so, and the base excess was minus 25. And that immediately made, makes you do a double take. You think, have they just got the, the bicarbonate and the base excess in the wrong boxes? But a repeat of that blood gas later showed the base excess again of minus 25.5 so yes that's that's a true number the bicarbonate is down at 4.4 base excess minus 25 and the ph of 6.98 someone did an ammonia to double check and that's not particularly exciting so it's only one two on um so um what are your impressions and there's also very healthy uh, urine dip here So has anyone got any ideas? We don't have to have a diagnosis, but what's going on with this baby, in a word? Yeah, so Maria, thank you. You said metabolic ac acidosis. SEDAF has gone right in there with renal tubular acidosis, um, which is a, a safe bet from a, a talk from a nephrologist. Um, but at the moment, should we just stick with metabolic acidosis? It's a very low bicarb, and we have to figure out why this baby is so acidotic. Um, and um, and this is very profound. You can, you can imagine um, thinking, how, how can this be so low? Um, so the first thing that goes through most people's brains in this situation is that, is this a metabolic condition? Is this a, um, some kind, which is why someone did pneumonia here. Pneumonia is relatively normal. Um, 
um, they did an ultrasound scan and, and this time you can see that there's a bit of a brightness here you can see these areas of calcification so there's some nephrocalcinosis in this kidney so what would so we have a, a case here of a metabolic acidosis and that'll explain the tachypnea as well they're trying to compensate by blowing off um, CO2, blowing off acid, um, but they remain very acidotic. So what's the next piece of information that you want to know? How would you approach this child with metabolic acidosis? Is anyone going to, what would you want to do next? What would you want to maybe calculate next? Is it the anion gap? Yeah, absolutely. So the anion gap. So why why would we why would we calculate the anion gap? What's that going to tell us? They, if they have like a normal anion gap. There's a list of conditions it might be. Yeah. So it's whether it's they've got an elevated than normal anion gap. So this is the this is the calculation for a anion gap. So sodium, which is essentially the cations minus the anions, and we we can sometimes ignore the potassium in that because it's such a low number. Um, so sodium minus the bicarbonate and chloride. And that difference is called the anion gap. And the normal anion gap is 12 to 16. And the reason why there is a gap, the reason why it's not balanced, because of course, electrochemically, there's always going to be balance. There's always going to be a, the true anion gap is zero. Otherwise, if we had um, uh, uh, an electrochemical gradient, it would be very... Um, we would probably electrocute ourselves every time we went to the toilet and had a wee. So we need electrochemically neutral blood. So this anion gap is kind of like a false um, number because the difference is gonna be unmeasured anions. Exactly, Dave has written it there. So for example, albumin in particular is negatively charged. We don't measure that as uh, in, in the anion gap calculation. So the anion gap is a, a measure of those unmeasured and ions. Um, so normal anion gap is 12 to 16, but if you're including potassium, you could say 16 to 20. Um, so in this particular case, um, we can, should we, should we calculate the anion gap? Let's have a look. So you've got, can anyone calculate it for me? You've got sodium 138. And the chloride is 118. Um, and the bicarb is 4.4. So I've got an anagraph of about 16. 15.6 exactly. Yeah. So we'd say this is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis as opposed to an elevated anion gap metabolic, metabolic acidosis. Um, and so what's the difference between a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis and a elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis? What's happening in a condition where there's an elevated anion gap? So in an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis, you're having an excess of a new acid, you might be a um, an, an excess of, for example, of um, ketones causing a ketoacidosis, an excess of um, uh, um, inorganic, I'm sorry, organic acids from a metabolic condition, um, an excess of lactate acid and a lactic acidosis. Um, so um, anytime there's an excess of a new source of acid, you get an elevated anion acidosis. In, in a condition where you're losing bicarbonate, um, uh, that's where you get a normal anion acidosis, which is characterized also by a hyperchloremia. So if you get a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, it's because of the loss of bicarbonate. Um, and, and there's only two places in which you can lose bicarbonate in our body, really. It's from our guts, our bowels, or from our kidneys. So you can be quite safe in saying that if you have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, this patient is either going to be losing acid from her gut or her kidneys. If it was an elevated anion gap, then you'd have to look for other causes of an acidosis, such as metabolic cause or a poisoning 
or sepsis or decay. So just a bit on acid-base homeostasis. Um, we have basal metabolic reactions going on every moment of our lives um, and anything that we consume leads to acid excess. So carbon dioxide is the main form um, of waste in terms of when we oxidize carbohydrates, proteins and fat, and we produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide, 15,000 millimoles per day, which is volatile and we can expire this in our lungs. We also produce non-volatile acids, phosphates, sulfates, and non-volatile bases such as bicarbonate. And this excess acid is much less than the carbon dioxide we produce, but about 70 to 100 millimoles per day that needs to be excreted from our bodies. And this primarily happens in our kidneys. So kidneys excrete excess acid, and they can and they are responsible for maintaining normal acid-base balance. And there are two mechanisms primarily where this happens in the proximal tubule and distal convoluted tubule. In the proximal tubule, we prevent the loss of fil filtered bicarbonate. We're essentially reabsorbing bicarbonate um, in the proximal tubule. And we also have a net secretion of acid as well, primarily um, occurring in the distal convoluted tubule. This is just a, a quick example of the proximal tubular cells and how um, and how, how they can serve bicarbonate. So when bicarbonate is in the lumen of proximal tubule, this combines with, um, with, with hydrogen ions, which are excreted. Um, and then using the, because of the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, which exists on these brush borders of, of the uh, proximal tubular cells, that can be, um, uh, broken down to water and carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is reabsorbed, and then the carbon dioxide and water then recombine through the same enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, um, which can then be broken down to the hydrogen and bicarbonate, which bicarbonate is so, uh, reabsorbed through these channels, and then the protons, the hydrogen ions, are then recycled. So this is just a, a um, an overview of how the proximal tubule handles acid, but essentially the net effect is the reabsorption of bicarbonate. This is how bicarbonate is reabsorbed from the proximal tubule, facilitated, facilitated by the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. There are also other ways of secreting acids. So um, there's the hydrogen ATPase pumps, which is responsible for about 10% of excretion of acid. And then the, the sodium, um, hydrogen exchange exchanges the NHE3, which which is the vast majority of acids is excreted through these channels. Then there are also other titratable acid secretions, so other buffers such as phosphates, urates, creatinine. These also can buffer um, our um, acid and excrete protons in that way. And we excrete about 30 millimoles per day in that way, and then also ammonium excretion, so glutamine is amino acids taken into the proximal tubular cells and broken down into ammonia, which, which can then be another way of excreting excess protons. So just going into the, into the collecting ducts again and thinking about where the aldosterone receptors work, here this is the, H, the, the hydrogen ATPase. Um, and then if you remember, aldosterone upregulates this whole system through the upregulation of these particular AE1 transporters um, and allows for excess acidification of the urine. So if you think about it in the, in the collecting ducts, we are, we are allowing for hydrogen to be excreted into the urine and therefore making the urine more acidic in the distal portion of the tubule. And when we have a renal tubular acidosis in the distal segment. It could be because of any one of these um, kind of mutations. The SLC4A1 mutation causes a knockout of this transporter or the ATPV6 mutations causing a knockout of these um, potassium, sorry, these hydrogen ATPAs um, pumps. And then of course, um, there, if we have the, the hyperaldosteronisms as well, which also in a similar way cause a metabolic acidosis through the same mechanisms in the uh, collecting ducts.
so I just wanted to give you an overview about the approach to acidosis. So if you have a patient with a pH of less than 7.35 and low bicarbonate, we need to calculate the anion gap. If it's a normal anion gap or a high anion gap, if it's a high anion gap, you think about all of those other conditions not related to kidneys um, and um, other sources of acid, uremia, diabetes, di diabetic ketoacidosis, um, lactate, um, salicylic acid, if they've ingested aspirin, for example, any other ex exogenous source of acid. If they have a normal anion gap, the next question to ask or think about is diarrhea or stoma. I've been asked as a nephrologist to review plenty of children and infants with an unknown metabolic acidosis, and they'll often be neonates, and they've got stomas from the NEC. And, um, that's usually the extent of my review. I'll say that they're likely acidotic because of their stoma and the excess loss of bicarbonate from their stoma. And the treatment's just to supplement their bicarbonate levels and to, to, to try and um, to try and reverse the stoma as soon as possible. But if they don't have any diarrhea or losses and they have a no stoma or any other reason to suspect the gut, the next thing to do is to check the urine pH. So if the urine pH is low, so they have acidified urine, then you can, you can if you remember that if they can acidify their urine and give themselves a low urine pH, then the problem is not in the distal portion of the tubule. It's not, a, a, the, it's not in the uh, collecting duct, distal complex tubule. This is all in the proximal tubule that the problem is happening. So if they've got glucose urea, amino acid urea, then you need to think about things like a Fanconi syndrome and those conditions related to Fanconi syndrome where there's a proximal tubulopathy such as nephropathic cystinosis or other mitochondrial conditions. Um, but if they don't have any other, other signs of a Fanconi syndrome, then it's, it's very, very unlikely to be correct data, but you can get very rarely some isolated proximal renal tubular acidosis, but that's exceptionally rare. So, and I've never seen one. Um, so again, so you have a, a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis with a low urine pH and some glucose urea or amino acid urea um, or, or a low excretion of phosphate and excess in, in phosphate then um, phosphate excretion then you're thinking about Fanconi syndrome. Um, if the pH is high, so if they don't have, if they have alkaline urine, then the defect is going to be in the part of the nephron which is responsible for acidifying the urine. So there's a problem with the distal aspect of the, the nephron and the collecting tubules. And then the next question to ask ourselves is whether the potassium is high or low. And if the potassium is high, then that will lead us to a set of conditions which cause hyperkalemic renal tubular acidosis, such as aldosterone insufficiency or an obstructive uropathy where you get type 4 renal tube acidosis um, due to obstruction as pseudo hypoaldosteronism. If the potassium is low, then that will fit in with a distal renal tubular acidosis. And so this is a good way of being able to, if you like, funnel our uh, investigations into diagnosing the right, the right condition. And if you go back to this this particular case, if I go all the way back to the, the the front card, you can say already just from what the ambulance drivers have written um, on the on the transfer, you can see that this patient has a metabolic acidosis. It's a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis um, in a patient with no gut problems, and they've got alkaline urine and a pH of eight in their urine. So just from a blood gas in a urine dip, I can already tell you that this patient has a distal renal tubular acidosis. And I think that's a very satisfying diagnosis to make from very little information. And the uh, genetic tests in this baby confirm that to be the case. So that's an overview of um, renal tubular acidosis. Um, do you have any questions?